Hello everybody and welcome to Tutorial Tuesday. Tutorial Tuesday. Oh, it's Wednesday. Sorry about that. Yesterday was the last day I could spend with my little sister before she went back to college, so I decided to take the day off. Because that's actually okay to do once in a while. If you need to take a day off from working or for your schedule, that's completely fine. So it's Tutorial Wednesday today instead of Tutorial Tuesday. I like how even when I record a video, I get distracted by my fidget toys. Let's put that down. So today's tutorial isn't quite as much of a tutorial as it is a step-by-step -step through what processes I take to make a certain thing. And that thing is drawing something in black and white. This is specifically for like two or three people who ask me, how do I render in black and white? I don't know if there is a core lesson that can be taught about rendering in black and white but I'll show you how I do it. Now, obviously it's super different doing it digitally over traditionally. I'm going to approach this using the iPad Pro like usual, but I'm going to do it only on one layer and I'm only going to do it with brushes and pencils that you would find in real life. That way I can help other people who might be doing, I don't know, a still life with paper and ink or paper and charcoal. So we're gonna try making this for everybody instead of just a digital tutorial. Now the person who asked this is asking specifically for black and white. Their complaint was that when they're rendering, everything seems to be shades of gray in between and they keep coming up with the same shade of gray. So that's kind of the angle I'm going to be attacking is how to get your nice high, low contrast. So let's get to it. So you guys can see this picture I took. This is going to be the still life that we work on. Now, if you're looking at a picture in color, you can still do this. I'm actually going to turn it black and white just for ease's sake. But kind of even with your regular eyes, it's easy to tell light and dark apart. So obviously, let's make sure we're on another layer. This over here is one of the darkest points, specifically this shadow or this reflection. reflection. Then one of your lightest points over here and then the foreground. So our lowest point is black, our highest point is white. And this over here is kind of where the midtones are going to happen. So keeping that in mind, I'm going to shrink this up into the corner and we're gonna draw it. I'm gonna start with my pencil sketch. For those using Procreate, this is the 6B pencil. I'm not gonna put it all the way on black because honestly, pencils don't go completely black. First, I'm gonna sketch out basic shapes. Not really going for accuracy at the moment. I just want to make sure that we have a shape to work off of. Admittedly, I am going very dark. In real life, this would be a lot lighter pen pressure or a lot lighter stroke pressure because I wouldn't want to have to erase it. And then I'm gonna put in this ruffly stuff. Let me turn off the photo for it and just kind of, you know, I can just move the photo. There. So there, about five minutes just sketching out the basic shapes. Looking at the still life, I'm going to use my nice hard dark 6B pencil to start putting in the areas that have the darkest shadows. So I'm going to start by blocking in some of the darker areas. If it's complete black, then go ahead and don't be, don't be afraid to just make it as dark as it needs to be. And take a little bit of liberty with it too. Unless you're trying to make something completely accurate, it doesn't need to be like completely accurate. If you notice back here, this is also almost as black as that. So make sure to fill that in. Now I'm going to press a little bit more lightly and get a general dark tone over the entire thing. This is when you're starting to build in your first grays. We can see the top rim of the cap is really dark. There's a shadow coming down and I'm putting that in very dark. So now we have the, oh, 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 and check out how dark this shadow is right over here. So now we have some of our darkest areas in the picture filled in. My next step is working on the midtones. This coming down, press a little bit lighter, is gonna be medium dark, just like this. And remember, all one layer here. I'm trying not to have the digital advantage over you guys where I can just literally go, oops, I don't like that, and undo it. 
The shadow of the bottle is actually lighter than the bottle itself. So we'll have to keep that in mind. In fact, this tone right over here, right in the middle right there, is about the same tone as the shadow over here. So we'll have to keep that in mind. So whatever lightness we fill in over here is going to be the same lightness, because that's actually reflecting upwards, see? The light over here is bouncing and reflecting onto the, uh, onto the glass. So we just make sure to keep that a very similar lightness. We can fill that area in pretty dark back there. Now we're starting to define different parts. Let's put in the shadow from this box. It's actually not completely black. It's pretty dark, but it's not black. So I'm going to work on edging in that shadow. And one disadvantage we have here is that we're working on a white piece of paper, which is always a pain in the butt. Let's fill in the shadow over here. Look at the darkness relative to other shadows, other tones in here. This tone over here is about as dark as that tone over there. So make sure to keep that pen pressure in that area. Now we have some really kind of, they're not super dark, but they're getting there. Some very defining shapes in here. I'm just gonna put those in gently. And this is a, this is a cylinder, so I'm going to work up this way. I'm not worried too much about texture in this one since we're more focusing on light and dark. Just putting in those lights and darks. And if we look at the bottle cap relative to the paper behind it, the bottle cap's actually super dark. So that means we need to start darkening everything else because we're starting to realize exactly how dark this bottle is compared to the entire picture. Now it looks like a piece of glass bottle. We can even add, the, even though this label is white, it's not completely white. Completely white is like up here almost. This has a cooler tone to it and it's a little bit darker. Now look at this tone relative to this tone. This is a lot darker than that one. So you know whatever tone you had in here, shade in one step darker on the side. Then there's a similar and then if you look, this blue over here, that little stripe of blue shading here, is about the same as that. Unfortunately, we don't have any colors to work with. Because this is a black and white study, and this is going to be a very light piece of shading right there. And the bottle shadow is coming right against the side. And if you look, this entire piece of paper is a darker tone. So now we're just going to lightly shade that darkness all over it. Because we've placed our shadows and now we want to start making accurate tones of everything else in the background. So the base part of our study is done. Now is when I would start smudging. So let me grab something that's accurate to smudging. I'm going to try soft pastel. And the step I want to do before this is getting a tone in the background. You see this over here, the paper, the paper is not completely white. So I'm going to put my pencil sideways and I'm going, oops, oh, we'll have to merge these down. I'm going to put my pencil sideways and I'm going to give everything a very even light tone because it's not completely white. There is almost nothing that's completely white in here. And we'll define our super bright highlights by erasing. So a nice bright tone. I'm going to pretend that this plane is back here. So I'm going to add in a little bit of darkness, then lift it up. Just a piece of paper. Just imagining that there's a piece of paper back here, because there technically is. And adding background context will help the things in your foreground, the things that you're studying, have tone. And now we get to smudge. It's gonna get a little bit dirty and your lines may get a bit muddy, but that's okay because we can always redraw your lines. Make this big. I'm just gonna go in and even out the texture. This is the same thing as if you took a chamois cloth and just went in, or a chemise, I think sometimes they're called, and you went in and you blended everything together, especially if you have a nice, light, smooth charcoal. Exact same thing, exactly what we're doing right now. Blend some of your shadow together. We just want more even tones, so then we have bases to work off of. I 
Okay, we have generally blended all of our tones together. Now we just have to put some of them back in. This is also just to make sure that we're not relying on lines because lines are just kind of like a bit of a handicap. You should be defining your edges by using the differences in dark and light. I can already tell that we did not make the roll of paper in the back dark enough, so I'm going to go over again with a darker tone. So I'm going to go over again with a slightly darker tone. Not too dark, but dark enough to start defining it a bit. You can also use this to give it a bit more shadow. As an artist, you are allowed to overemphasize things for readability. It's one of the best tools you have, the tools of your own imagination and the tools of artistic license. We're using our artistic license to make sure that the edges are readable for people looking. Now look right over here. This dark edge is up against a very light part of the roll. So that means we need to go back in, darken this up, try to make it more accurate to our original reference. The original reference has some serious dark bits coming down this way and along the edge. Right over here, for instance, that's pretty black. And then down this entire corner is a bit shaded. I'm using some cross hatching here. And that means we want to redefine and pump this area. Just pump it nice and dark. I'm just going to leave that there for a moment. Now I'm going to take my eraser tool, which I'm going to go back and I don't know if I have like a true eraser, but I'm going to fake it by using wet acrylic, which is round and kind of blurry. So I'm going to go back in and lighten these parts up just like they are in the reference. Put in some of those lines defining that and it gets darker over there and then some more highlight lines running along. So now we've defined the rear part of the bottle. It looks a bit messy, but again, we just need to keep cleaning up. The rear part of the cap is dark. There's a very dark edge line coming along it. The darkest part is in the middle, and we already have that defined. The top of the cap has a very mild gradient going from the back to the front. Now I'm going to put in a slightly darker shadow coming down this way just like in the picture. We can put a tiny, if you look at the bottom of the box, there's actually a quite defining line of shadow going along the bottom. So I'm going to replicate that very defining bit of shadow. And you can see now it reflects right over there, kind of curved like that. Now we can start putting in more of these shadows. Reflections are a pain in the butt, which is kind of the reason I chose this because it's a very good way to practice your lights and darks, especially on a dark glassy surface because it'll show you tons of reflections. And it'll train your eye and train your hand, especially because a bottle like this has the highest points of reflections. Because right now we're gonna go back to our eraser and see these highlights right over here? Those are some of the brightest tones on the picture and it's right against the very darkest black. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to put those in. There's also some right along the rim of the cap. It gets a teeny bit lighter, but it's a blue, so it's not completely light. And of course, let's define the edges of the paper. It looks like the top is brighter than the dark. So now we have a very glassy looking bottle. And we're not working with just a million different shades of gray because we really, really boosted our contrast. That's the important part, taking liberties with your contrast and allowing it to boost. I'm going to darken these tones in here a little bit because that's how it is on the picture. Looks like I got my perspective a teeny bit wrong. Push this this way a teeny bit. Which is also an advantage for me though, because uh, look at all these itty bitty reflections in here. That means that now we have given ourselves a little bit of room to put those in without having to worry. Just like that. That's all I'm gonna do for it. And maybe straighten the edge of the bottle. And what's happening underneath that cap? It's a little bit difficult to see. So I'm going to use my artistic license to put in what I want. And that's just how I'm going to define the center piece of that bottle, since it doesn't really want to be defined. So our bottle is done. What about the rest of the pieces? The bottle is a little bit easy in a way because it has high, high, high points of contrast. The difficulty comes in areas like this giant roll. 
they all have a bunch of mid-tones, but not necessarily extremely high points of contrast. The way I would approach this is doing the same thing we did before. I'm going to put in not quite as dark as our bottle, but pretty dark shadows, gently following some of the crazy shapes we have in here. Again, this is more about the shadows themselves, not the accuracy of the shapes. So let me just come in here, put in some of these weird shapes. You'll notice that the dark edge over here, the white sticker is being defined by the dark edge of the paper. We'll make sure it's nice and dark, and that the shadow below it is even darker, and it has a nice hard line. And there's a shadow. There's, there's a shadow coming along the inside of here. It lightens along that edge, and then it gets dark again. I also think I made it a little bit too dark in that one particular area, so I'm going to blend it out. I'm going to blend this bottom bit a teeny bit. I'm going to blend this side. I'm going to push this upwards. It's honestly a lot easier for me to do sharp edges than something fuzzy like this. So I suppose this is a learning experience for me too. This feels like college all over again. Now if you are having a huge amount of trouble and things are getting a little bit difficult, there's an obvious cheat, and that's to take a picture of your reference and put it into black and white mode. But I think at the moment we should be okay. Obviously the bottle looks quite realistic and it's a lot more polished than the other pieces. If you look, I actually made a mistake. Look how bright this is compared to the darkness of its shadow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my eraser, low opacity, and just slightly daub this away. It does get darker towards the top, so I'm going to keep that. This is an emphasized version. Obviously, it wouldn't be quite that light. What's happening is that the white background that this little box is sitting on is reflecting its light back onto the box. And so there's a highlight along the side, which is what makes... It's right over here. Look, you can even see it. Boing! Just like that. That's why it's light. And then there's none of that highlight going into the shadow. There's a little bit, but also you have to consider the light I was using and why it's casting a fuzzy shadow. The background light in my room was kind of bluish, which is why there's blue in that shadow right there. But we're not going to talk about that. That's another lesson. So we're going to take the shadow and nice, make it nice and dark. Define that edge a little bit more. Yeah, just like that. It wraps around the back and it comes like that. And then this shadow, I don't think if we turned it black and white it would get much lighter. But since we are translating a color picture into a black and white picture, again we have to take our artistic license. So I'm going to pretend that that back area of the shadow is lighter. Remember, I'm being very delicate with my pen. And now let's define the edge of this box a little bit more, since it's fuzzy from our blending. Same thing with the top. You can see there's some hard lines coming along the top where the box was folding. So I'm going to put those in. I'm going to erase downwards next to the side of the box. And along the top, just making sure to define its edges. And now I'm going to take a little bit of artistic license for inside of the box itself. I'm going to make it a teeny bit darker than it should be, but only on one edge. I'm going to lighten it as it comes out to the other one. Now if you look, right along here, there's a bright highlight. So two steps to make this highlight come out. First, we're going to smudge so it's a more consistent shade of gray. Then we're going to take our eraser, or more realistically, if you're working traditionally, I would actually use a white pencil, because that's going to give you a nice bright highlight. I'm going to take that along, higher opacity run it along this outer edge, just to see that the light is touching it, like that. If you want to emphasize it even more, you can add a teeny bit of darker shade right along the edge as it comes this way, because that'll create a higher point of contrast. I'm going to, ah, come here. I'm going to erase back here. 
so I can work on a blank slate over here. And also, see how highlighted this is right there? I'm going to go and I'm going to take the eraser, and just the eraser, and that's what we're going to use to create this highlighted point on the box. The light is hitting that flap of box directly. Now you can kind of tidy up up here. I did this sloppily. I'm going to make a nice line there. It's coming up like this, shaded in. I hate to say, but part of my style is actually being kind of sloppy. I like being sloppy. It adds character to the picture, especially if we're just doing like a quick 20, 30 minute study. Don't need to be overbearing on yourself. Don't need to be perfect. I think being perfect is seriously overrated. That shade in there, let's push that up a teeny bit. Soften the edges back here. And it looks like this box has the same, this part of the box has the same exact bright highlight along the top that its little brother piece has down there. So we're gonna just run that along the top. And it doesn't actually look that right, but you know what? It doesn't need to be perfect. I think one of the reasons is because I ran it a little bit too low. There. Blammo. So the box is basically done. If you really wanted, you could smooth out its shadow, but right now the big problem is our shades of gray, and this is difficult. It is that big piece of paper right here. That big piece of paper is still causing us problems. So compared to the background color, it is still pretty dark, so let's give it some, so let's give it a bit of shadow, a bit more shadow than before. Let's define its top a tiny bit. Seems to be a piece over here. Let's run the shadow that way, run the shadow this way. We're starting to get our tones figured out, which is really good, because the tones can be a pain in the butt, let's be honest. Define that edge a bit more. Here's some shadows running this way. Just put my pen sideways so I can get a good texture out of it. And then you can see some vertical, uh, you can see some horizontal or lateral shades coming this way. So in this situation, really, really, really try using your brush to your advantage. You got some coming that way. And a whole weird bit in here. I'm just gonna let it be though. Now there are no true white highlights on here, so we can kind of just leave it alone. So as our final piece, I'm gonna turn the entire thing black and white. Look how close, look how close our illustration is versus our photograph. This is a very similar tone we have going, so we did good on that. The tones in here are very similar to the tones in here, so we did good on that. And the tones in here are very similar to the tones in here, so we did good on that. Now, if you wanted to, you could have just turned this reference picture black and white at the very beginning and not had to go through that, but then you wouldn't be learning. What you should have learned from this entire exercise is that first, you work on your darkest and your lightest points, and then everything else is a game of relativity. How gray is something versus the darkest point, such as the shadow? If you look in here, this is an almost completely black shadow, whereas this is a very dark gray. In fact, this gray here is the same gray as over there. Did we get that in here? Gray here, gray there, they're a very similar tone. So all you have to do is figure out relative tones and then use your artistic license to push contrast. And I really, really want to emphasize that. We made this darker than it is in here, but it helped define how deep it was. So it was actually useful. I hate to say, but learning how to draw in black and white is one of those things where it takes a bunch of different artistic skills and a bunch of experience to do so. I did a lot of still life studies when I was younger, just out of blatant curiosity, not out of wanting to actually become a better artist. I was like, hey, that big cool artist to do this, maybe I should try it. It really is though, if, if you want to hack, excuse you, if you want a quote unquote hack for black and white, Find your darkest darks, find your lightest lights, block them in, and then find your in-between tones. And it's all relative to the dark and it's all relative to the white. You can accidentally come up with like 
a crap ton of grays in the middle. And I'll actually show you a picture where that's a problem for me right now. Also, a quick thing before anybody gets freaked out by this picture, this is Yadalon and the main character, and he does not have a mouth. All they're doing is having an extremely happy, kind of intimate hug. They're not in love. This is literally just a really, really, really big guy snuggling his face against a tiny human. So please don't get any wrong ideas about this picture. It's one of my favorite pictures because it's very, very physically intimate, yet not sexual. So I'm just, I'm not even going to go into that. If you know about the Magi, you know about the Magi, you know they don't have sex or anything. Anyhow, take a look at this picture. With color on it, of course, the edges are defined. But then if we turn it black and white, you can see that it's having a lot of problems. A lot of these tones are starting to mix together, at least by my standards. Also, his arm is super duper weird. I need to figure out the perspective on that arm. I hate how I rendered it first. See, I make mistakes too. I rendered it first to make it look nice and realistic without actually figuring out the perspective properly. And now I'm going to have to redo the rendering on a really nice arm. Eh, things happen. Why are you always in the way? Thank you. But you see, this is the same problem as I think some other people are happening. Uh, one technique you can use with digital art is you can first use black and white to define your brightest brights and your darkest darks to make sure everything is high contrast and it's all settled out. And then you can color over it, probably using overlay or hue or multiply or another one of those, you know, one of those things. Uh, I did this, but I only started figuring out the highlights and the darks later, which means that some areas in here look a little bit in undefined. So it's not only a problem that younger artists have, it's not only an inexperienced artist problem. This happens to people like me who are of intermediate skill. It happens to people who are of high skill. All you need to do is you need to go in and figure out your high points of contrast first, then fill everything else in and make sure that two pieces of flesh or whatever right next to each other have a defining line. You can even look at my hands there's a shadow running right down the middle of the in-between of them. And then you have a shadow, not, not on this, you have a shadow running along the outer edge. Just find those pieces of contrast to define everything else from the background. Like drawing me right now might be a bit difficult because the hues on this hand, if you turn this black and white, will probably be mixing in with the carpet. Or for instance, uh, this shirt is almost completely undefinable from my um, auxiliary wardrobe over there or my chair. So it's really, when a situation like that arises and you don't naturally in your reference have high enough points of contrast for it to be readable, you have to use your artistic license to lighten certain things, darken certain things, and make sure that it's readable for your viewer. And that's on that. Now again, sorry that this is Tutorial Wednesday instead of Tutorial Tuesday. I really did want to spend time with my family and say goodbye to my sister. So I will see you guys tomorrow for Art Talk Thursday. What are we even talking about tomorrow? So, oh, tomorrow is about the basics of branding. Very important lesson if you want to go professional and try selling your work. So as per usual, drink your water, get your sleep, believe in yourself, and follow your dreams. I will see you guys tomorrow and have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs>